appreciate everyone coming. This is a different format. Any of you have been here um, to some of our, our speaker series, and we've, we try different formats. Um, in this format, what I wanted uh, Maurice to talk about was just what he came and what he shared in his life and what some of his experiences. And he said he's, he's open. He said you could ask the types of questions you want to um, ask. He said his life has been public. So I asked him to just go from where he wants to go instead of me talking specifically about leadership. I'm sure that's going to come up, but I wanted him specifically to just come and talk about what he's doing. You have his. You have your, um, the bio in front, I'm going to have um, Mr. Frum can read it, but I just wanted you to know that it's kind of open and he'll let you know how to stop, ask questions, what flow. But I wanted to thank you also for coming today and hopefully you'll get something out of it. Adam. I just want to say it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker. Um, Ashley has no need for introduction. Um, and, you know, he touched all of our hearts as uh, Buckeye fans when he burst onto the scene as an excited, and I mean excited, football player uh, and helped Ohio State clinch the 2002 National Championship. He was later drafted in 2005 uh, by the Denver Broncos. And his personal challenges gave him time to develop the, the, his brand as a person and his distinct personality and drive to empower diverse audiences across the world have made him not only the football player he was, but nationally sought after speaker as well. Maurice founded the Red Zone, a behavioral health agency dedicated to empowering youth and adults that are in need. Um, I want you to spend more time reading about it in the, in the bio. I don't want to sit here and read about the bio. I will tell you that um, based on my reading and understanding of what he has started and what he's doing, is far beyond what he could have ever done on the field because he's reaching more and more people now than he did us as fans. So I want to, with no further ado, turn this over to Maurice and let him speak to you about where he's at and what's coming up. Uh, good afternoon, I guess, to everybody. Um, one, I am happy to be here. Uh, I live in town, so I didn't have to travel far, so that was cool. Um, also, I hurt my leg today, so if you see me limping, uh, like that's like me trying to like hinder my injury, right? Uh, but I, I really say that uh, out of all speaking engagements I've probably done, I, I actually enjoy coming back to like the court systems and anything to do with anybody that has dealt with people in incarceration, trouble, social service, in any capacity, uh, just because a lot of what I'm doing now was birthed out of this space. Um, I was telling the gentleman before I came, uh, I actually feel responsible to do this stuff uh, because I'm pretty sure a lot of you come across people uh, who, you know, you probably get tired of, you probably say like, man, you know, is this dude ever gonna change? Uh, but I really wanted to show up and just say, I'm, I'm a product of somebody who can eventually get it right. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Right, <laughs> so, and so I'm in social service, so I know what y'all go through, right? So, um, but I think one of the uh, one of the best ways to uh, do this is like, you know, if you have a question, even while I'm talking, just interrupt me and it'd be like an open dialogue. And if you if you, if you happen to be more inquisitive, but I also think like uh, one of the coolest things that I've uh, learned in my life is that like stories are the most like impactful ways to share information. And I could just talk about what I came from, how I got to where I was at and eventually, you know, what I'm doing now and, and what I plan on doing moving forward. And I won't, I won't get too far into childhood, but I think like understanding childhood and how it affected me as an adult uh, is like highly important. And so, you know, obviously I grew up in Youngstown uh, and I always say I like grew up in like the mid nineties craze, you know, where you had a bunch of gang violence, a bunch of murders. Uh, this is like in the era where you had, you know, Youngstown being like, you know, known for uh, a bunch of violence, right? And as a result from that, I really believe that that attitude that I basically played the football, that I played football with came from being inside the neighborhood uh, projecting like so much machoism and toughness and things of that nature. And that's the uh, mentality that basically uh, that, that, that I encompass, you know, when I'm coming up in the neighborhood. And so as a result from that, I was incarcerated three times in the juvenile system. First one was for um, uh, stealing the car, going to joyride. The second one was for uh, breaking inside of a house. No, the second one was for fighting a skating ring. And the third one was for breaking in, uh, inside of a house. And so the third one, I broke inside of a house. And as I broke into the house, uh, the gentleman who was actually um, living there, he basically woke up, came down the hallway, and as he came down the hallway, seeing me and the other gentleman inside of the room, he ran out the room, he ran down the steps, uh, locked himself in the door, 
And in a panic, I ran down the hallway and jumped out the uh, second story window and uh, literally busted my head on the window, uh, fell to the ground and eventually ended up getting caught. And as a result from that, I ended up getting uh, 13 staples in the top of my head. And that's the real reason I wore number 13, because it was like that moment uh, that kind of like changed my life. You know, that's like ESPN didn't tell you all that, right? <laughs> so, um, so that was like the real reason that it happened. And so I ended up going downtown to the juvenile facility and um, midway through the evening, this is like my eighth grade year transition into ninth grade. I went to um, uh, the juvenile dormitory and uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Mr. Roland Smith, who was a correctional officer. And Mr. Smith had came and got me and he was like, yo, you know, you, uh, you shouldn't be in this situation. And uh, to make a long story short, he went to the judge the next day and the judge allowed uh, him to sort of like be my mentor during the summer because he's a high school football coach. And so they gave me an ankle monitor and I was on a probation, not a probation, but house arrest for the entire summer. I was able to go to work out, lift weights and do all this other nonsense and then come back home. And so to make a long story short, I ended up getting into high school football. Uh, moved out of the inner city. Um, I was still in the inner city, but I uh, went to a school called Austin Town Fitch, had a little bit, bit of success my freshman year and so on and so forth. 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, I ended up basically being like a, um, a superstar for high school. And so by this time I come down to Ohio State, you know, like any other kid who comes here, think you'll go to the NFL in three years and all this nonsense happens. And so I come here, uh, work my tail off, end up starting. And really what, what people don't realize, and I'll just, you know, I'll share it with you all for, um, just for an understanding purpose, uh, like all of my issues basically started when I basically became like famous here, right? So you, you wake up one day, you Joe Blow, and you go out to the community, nobody knows who you are, you just kind of like go and mind your business. And then you fast forward, you know, to the next afternoon, the next day, everybody in the state or in the city knows who you are. And uh, I think what happened was, it was like these like unspoken expectations on how you should behave or act or do what you want to. And so from there, um, you know, after the game, I remember we went to, um, it was a club off of Sinclair called uh, Studio 69, I think. I don't, he know, he shook his head. <laughs> so there's some people who, some people may know, some people not, you know what I'm saying, but those are the days, right? So I went there and, uh, and prior to that, you know, I didn't, uh, just to be like blunt, you know, didn't drink, didn't drug, didn't do none of that. I was like the kid who just lifted weights, go back to the dormitory, go home and do that stuff. And so I had a bunch of success, first game comes, I'm having all this, you know, success, people yelling for you, screaming for you. And then when I go out that night, you know, uh, you know, obviously, you know, I went out and people liked me. Like, you know, I was like an okay guy. Like I'm not handsome or not like that. I'm like just a, I look like a man, like, like a football player, right? So I go out that night, I'm like all of a sudden attractive. So I'm like, yo, this is kind of cool. <laughs> like the girls like me, you know what I'm saying? And so uh, y'all know what I'm talking about, right? PG for the courtroom, right? So it was like, okay, this is kind of cool. Everybody likes you now, right? And so I think at that moment, uh, when I actually look back on it, that's what really got me. You know, say so you turn into a celebrity, you're not really ready for it. And so from there, you know, the entire season, I was just, you know, going back to practice and I was really living for the weekends, you know, just to have the thrill on the weekends, the party, you bring 30, 40, 50 people with you, it was just a good time. It was almost like you was living like this fantasy in your mind. You know, if you all can just understand like this time, this was like the MTV Cribs time, y'all remember that? Like, so like, if you a kid, that's impressionable. Y'all can look at it like a joke, but you know, you're a young black kid from the hood. You're like, yo, I want to live like this. And so that's like actually what happened. You start to live out these fantasies in your head. Uh, what really no, you know, my mother, my father, they, they didn't go further than me. I was just kind of like trying to navigate myself. You know, even a lot of these kids down here at these universities, they're just trying to navigate life themselves because a lot of these kids, you know, first generation college kids, you know, you're just trying to figure out, you know, what do you do with fame and all that stuff. So make a long story short, I did a bunch of stuff I wasn't supposed to do. Uh, my, my freshman year, my sophomore year, they come back the, um, my, my, my sophomore year in the NCAA obviously uh, suspended me and I can kind of connect the dots from my childhood into now. And so when they suspended me, uh, they told me, hey, you have to um, take a, a cut in your scholarship check, which is like 1100 bucks, I was getting like 550. The second part was uh, you can't uh, get the classes that basically we, we provided for you, you have to re-enroll as a regular student. And the third thing was that I couldn't use any of the football facilities. And so that's kind of like the same thing, like, you know, let me take you, take your check, you know, take you for away from your friends and then basically put you into a situation where, you know, you have to fend for yourself where you don't have a skill set. And so I've been pushed through school since like 10th grade, you know, so I was always good to play football. So I didn't have to do the work. I get pushed through all of my work is kind of facilitated for me. And like, that's kind of what happened. And so when they put me in a situation where it was like tough, I'm like, yo, I can't do this work. If you're coming from like, I, like when I, when I, when I, when I went to college, like I was in like all your math, 050, your English, you know, remedial English and all the stuff that didn't pass. You know, I was taking like African American studies and officiating softball and 
all these other nonsense classes just to stay eligible. And so when they, tied, they told me to come back and get your core classes, I was like, yo, this is kind of tough. So to make a long story short, I struggled, uh, but just through help from other students, I ended up basically becoming eligible. Uh, and going into my sophomore year, they said, you know, we, have, we want you to go to psychological uh, courses before you come back next year or, or sit down with a psychiatrist next year before you come back onto the team. Uh, and I was like, no, I don't want to do any of this. Like, I'm out of here, right? So at this time, uh, I'm kicked away from the team. I refuse to go to the psychological support classes. And all of the, um, the, uh, the behavior, sort of like the academic unpreparedness, all that stuff kind of caught up to me, you know what I'm saying? And I just couldn't be a regular student to kind of like get back into uh, uh, school. And so from there, uh, I think that this was the first time I really experienced like depression. You know, I didn't even know depression was a real thing. I would feel like, like I would feel like be anxious during football games, but you know, if you watch film, if you lift weights, you can kind of combat it that way. Uh, but when it came down to uh, uh, like being depressed with life, I just didn't know how to like figure out my thoughts. Like, you know how your like, mind races all night, you know what I'm saying? And I would say it all the time. I used to be on these, um, I used to watch those commercials when, like when I was, uh, like younger, like if you're restless, if you can't sleep, like take this pill. I used to think I was a joke, you know what I'm saying? And I remember like when I was going through this stuff, I was like, man, I feel just like that commercial talking about, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but I just didn't have the, the, the humility to be like, yo, let me talk to somebody. I didn't even know what to do at that time, to be honest with you. Uh, but I remember feeling like that. But what kept me occupied and, and kept me entertained was going out, drinking, smoking, having sex, partying, having a good time. You follow me? And so that stuff felt good. That stuff kept me entertained. And it felt like it felt better than not being in school and playing football. And so this actually is stuff that happened like behind the scenes. And so anyways, I go to California for a couple of years and the same sort of behavior ensues and I'm entertaining myself. But it's almost like I know that at some point I'll be ready to go to the draft, but I, I'm not like connecting the dots that so I need to basically like be disciplined. So make a long story short, uh, I, get, uh, I get a call from the NFL. They tell me to come and go to the, uh, Indianapolis to basically be a part of the, the, the combine. I go out to the combine, perform horribly, and at this time I believe like I'm not going to play football again. I'll just go back to California and do what I was basically doing before. So I head back out there. A few months go by. This is April of 2005. I ended up basically getting drafted inside of the third round. I go to Denver. And from like the first few days, I knew it was like a train wreck. You know, I knew I wasn't going to make it. So uh, this went from me basically, you know, you know, hanging out till four or five, six in the morning in California to them uh, basically trying to uh, tell me to, you know, be, be inside of a structured environment, show up at six in the morning and basically work till six at night. And just from not being able to be disciplined for that extended period of time, you know, that's basically kind of like what happened. So they had, you know, they had many interventions. You know, they would try to sit me down with a, a therapist. They tried to sit me down with psychiatrists. They tried to sit me down with a bunch of people. And what ended up happening was I just kept on pushing away my help. And uh, the last time they actually tried, uh, they came to me and they said, you know, could you go and be on a practice squad? This was um, right before you we were getting ready to play the Indianapolis Colts. They asked me to be on a practice squad. And they said, could you be on a practice squad and work with a therapist uh, throughout the entire uh, season? And the only reason I rejected the therapist was because she was an old white lady. I was like, man, I'm black, I'm from the hood. In my mind, I think I'm a gangster. And so when she came to me, I was like, man, I'm not about to sit down with her and talk to my problems. You follow me? Sounds brutal, but this is like how a lot of kids think. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I feel like I could be honest with y'all. So I was like, I'm not about to sit down with her. And this was like, you know, this is 21, 22 year old Maurice. And so um, <clears throat> as I pushed her away, uh, and as I pushed all of the help away, we come back that next morning and uh, they call me and they say, you know, you're cut, you're basically fired, you know, so we have to get rid of you. And so uh, we go on the next day, uh, I go back to California. And when I was in California, I was like, man, it just feel odd. Like I feel lost, you know, like I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like 22 years old, I'm, I'm, I'm done with college, I'm done with the NFL, you know, I don't have any money. I'm just kind of like lost with life. And then at that point, you know, I called Jim Trussell at the time, he's still the coach. And I said, man, can you kind of help me get back on track? And so I moved back to Ohio. This was 20, this was September of 20, 2005. And I came back here and for the most part, you know, after I sat down with him, he was telling me, hey, get back in school uh, or you should go back out here and um, uh, get back to school and basically get, get in shape because I'll help you to go to NFL Europe. And so what happened was uh, I couldn't go back to school because I couldn't obviously do the work. And uh, when I came back to, uh, uh, to start to work out to get in shape, I would work out from like seven to 9.30 and then for the rest of the day, I wouldn't have anything to do. I was just like, kind of like, just be like, okay, you know, what am I supposed to do? And so at that point, you know, I still had like that Maurice Claret ego. Like I'm too, I'm like Maurice Claret, I can't go get a job. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't want to be doing a job because I'm too cool for it, right? And so I was still kind of stuck in this funky space where you, like reality is telling you like you're not nothing, but your ego is still telling you you're something. 
And so I just couldn't like connect those dots. And so I was like, okay, the natural thing for me to do is just to go back to doing what I was doing as a kid, right? Let me go ahead and start to commit crimes. Let me hustle drugs, let me rob people, let me do all this nonsense, right? And so literally right across the street, however we at, I end up catching a robbery case. This is December 31st, 2005, New Year's Eve headed to 2006. And so that happens. Uh, three weeks after that, I found out that my lady's pregnant. That was like a whole lot more pressure. And for the entire time of like 2006, I'm just lost, you know, just kind of loafing through Columbus, loafing through Youngstown. And I don't really know the judicial system. So I'm like, man, am I going to prison for a long time? Am I going for a short time? This is like a whole lot going on. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> they need to fix the AC in here, right? <laughs> so it's all good. I wish I could have came in shorts and a t-shirt. <laughs> But uh, I don't know. I don't like to wear a suit till you find that out. This thing will be off like 30 minutes after this, right? <laughs> this is all for the picture, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this, this ain't my style. Um, so, yeah, I, I wear shorts everywhere. I'll see. It'll be middle of the winter, I wear like, you'll see me. Top golf, I love to go to Top Golf too. If you ever been, if you see me, that's my hangout, right? So, um, so next thing I know, you know, I'm, um, I, you know, something like this, I catch the case, my, my lady's uh, pregnant, and just 2006 was a whirlwind. So uh, obviously the big chase, I don't know if you ever heard about heard the actual story, but I ended up basically getting arrested off of Bryce Road on the east side. So I came down to Columbus uh, about two, three in the morning. I ended up basically getting pulled over right there on Bryce Road. Um, uh, I kept, but basically what happened was I got off at the wrong exit. I came to the stoplight and I made a U-turn and there was a, uh, a police officer. I don't know if he was in like the Home Depot parking lot or just like in the area, but I made the U-turn and basically he had came out and followed me. And so I knew I was in the wrong because I had obviously weapons on me and I had a bulletproof vest. And so I was like, okay, uh, <clears throat> I know if he pulls me over, he's gonna see these weapons inside the car. So let me go ahead and basically try to get away. And out of everything I thought about, I thought of like about this episode from Cops. Y'all remember Cops, right? ESPN didn't tell y'all this one, right? <laughs> so. I was like, all right, on cops, you know, the dude pulled over, guy came behind him, and then when he got out the car, he basically sped off. And so in my mind, I was like, okay, this is about to work, right? So I pulled over, serious story, right? I'm laughing now. But I pulled over, he pulls behind me, he gets out the car, he walks up, he knocks on the window. I was like this, let me get going, right? So I get going and I get on the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the on-ramp going 70 east at this time. And so prior to this, I'd never been past, you know, Bryce Road, you know what I'm saying? So I'm riding, I'm going, and uh, out of nowhere, I just see all these cops behind me. I'm like, man, these dudes got here kind of fast, right? <laughs> so <laughs> serious. It's, yeah, yeah. Columbus police is like serious, man, I'll tell you that. And so I'm driving down the road, I'm going, and by this time I'm passed up 256. I didn't know what 256 was at the time. And so then I'm going further, right? And so I get towards going like towards Patascala. And this was before like the Amazon Center was built. So it used to be all on woods, right? So I was like, man, I'm brother from the hood. I don't do that, right? <laughs> I need to turn around, right? So I was like, you know, brothers don't do no woods, right? So I was like, <laughs> y'all know that brothers ain't doing no woods, right? So <laughs> you probably have to edit that out, right? <laughs> so I end up basically, I joke a lot too, right? So I end up basically going down the road coming back towards the uh, city of Columbus, and I really thought I was gonna get away. And, uh, and this was another thing, I thought spike strips were like just on cartoons or something, right? And so there was a guy sitting in like the middle, like whatever you call those things, the, the medium. And uh, as I came down, like at the last second, he threw him out, he busted tires. And then next thing you know, smoke flying everywhere. You know, it was like, you know, it was kind of crazy. And at that time I called my mother, I was like, mom, I'm about to get out the car and have a shootout with the police because like, I'm ready to die. Like it was more like me ready to die, not me wanting to kill them. But I knew if I'd have did that, at some point I would have did it, right? So I always called it like like divine intervention because whatever she said, it like made me pull off on the side of the road and go to um, what is it, a TJ's parking lot over there. I ended up pulling off to the side of the road. They took me out the car, uh, basically put me in the back of the truck or the paddy wagon, and basically that was over at that point. So. I remember even being in the paddy wagon. I was like, man, I'm about to go to prison. Like, I just knew that all the foolishness and all the craziness uh, that I had done to that point, uh, I just knew on some level was gonna stop, right? So I was like, man, let me go ahead and um, just get my head prepared for it, right? So I came downtown, uh, went to, um, I think this is the jail. I think whatever, whatever the jail is, they basically took that way. Yeah, we're gonna go that way, right? <laughs> so wherever it was at, all I remember just coming in and, and basically going through the process of, um, uh, going to jail, you know, so then they placed me uh, on the third floor and that was like the probably the uh, best and the worst thing, you know, after moving around so much to be like 
locked down for 23 hours. That is like nuts. You know, you just locked, like, locked in a cage all day. That's just like nuts, you know what I'm saying? And, and so that was a lot, you know? So like the first two weeks, I remember going to court for whatever reason, and uh, the judge had basically ordered like a mental health evaluation. And so she ordered it. And I gotta say, it was actually that thing that basically started everything you see now. Now, honest to God, I thank the, I thank the lady for doing that. And I've been taking medication since 2006, September 2006. But I remember inside of um, all of that isolation, I remember just me starting to get my mind back together. I, I didn't feel so anxious. My mind didn't feel like it was everywhere. And I just went through like a whole lot of like um, internal reflection. I was like, man, you know, how did you get to this space? You know, how do you go from, you know, having all of this success and you know, how are you back at ground zero? And I really couldn't connect the dots. And uh, I pro probably say I was in there for like three months and there was a gentleman who had dropped a book off to me. And I highly recommend that anybody who uh, is in social service in any capacity, it was a small book called As a Man Thinketh. It really impacted my life. It's like 70 pages long. And it basically was the first book that taught me like that thoughts are things, the things that you think about become a part of your life. Uh, the things that you speak about, you eventually create them. So as a man think of, so shall he become uh, till thought is linked with purpose, nothing intelligent shall ever happen. And I didn't realize how much this basically played a part and this played a part into my reality, right? And so up until that point, I used to really believe that I was a gangster from Youngstown. Follow me? And so everything I did, how I responded, how I dressed, how I wore my haircut, it was all for the purpose of I'm a gangster and I want you to see me as a gangster. You feel where I'm coming from? My mannerisms, everything. And I was like, oh, that's why you're here, right? I didn't click in my brain that I was supposed to transition to like a college student in college. It didn't click in my brain I was supposed to transfer to a professional football player, nor did I even understand like what that infrastructure meant. Now follow me? And so you got to understand boundaries and expectations. You got to have skill sets. You got to have like ways to practice that stuff. And so I really didn't get it. So like this was like a vague understanding, but it like made me understand. It made me like get into the mindset. I was like, man, your mind works. You know, up until this point, everything I got in my life was all from like stiff arming people, running people over. You feel where I'm coming from? It was all from like football, you know, break a tackle, everybody loves you. You know, you can entertain people, everybody loves you, but I didn't know how to think. And I, and I, th I think that I attribute that to childhood. Like, so when I got in trouble as a kid, I personally didn't start behaving better. I was just good at football. You follow me? That's the only thing that got me out of trouble. So the behavior was never corrected. The thinking was never corrected. And so then you transcend to college and you're done with football. What happened? Same kid. I was like a same 12, 13 year old kid who was breaking the houses. That's the kid who showed up. This is my understanding back on how I got to where I was at. So I go to prison and another guy saved my life. <clears throat> I get sentenced to seven and a half years, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Kella Conte. Anybody ever heard of him? He used to be the, he used to be the warden inside of uh, Toledo prisons and Kella Conte saved my life. So I came in there, it's like second day. Uh, I went to central office and uh, he said, my son's the same age. And he told me he was from Sierra Leone and uh, you got a question? Thanks, Andrew. Um, when you talked about reading that book, it's read in order. That do you go back to talk to the students that are coming in because a lot of the freshmen coming in to play football probably have that same mindset of how they grew up and. Yes. Yeah, so, so I go to I go to a ton of places. I go to um, I probably spoken to every university and. I got some contracts for university where I constantly go back, you know, like Connecticut basketball team, I work with them. But I go to, I go to places where I go back, work with Florida State and all that stuff before. And, um, but the, the, the answer is yes. Uh, but for, for um, I guess to jump back into the story, I ended up basically, um, Kelly Conte basically uh, was the guy that set me down. He said he was from Sierra Leone. And he said, and his father used to be the chief of the village. And he said in Sierra Leone, uh, when guys would get in trouble, we would bring them closer to the village repair them, figure out what's going wrong, support them and send them back out. He said, in America, you all throw people away. Y'all look at people once they get in trouble, like they'll never get right. And he said, I don't want this to be your experience while you're here. So I was like, all right, you know, cool. And so he's like, man, I'm about to put you in a bunch of, which, which I know now as a therapeutic courses. He's like, let me put you in a bunch of uh, coursework to basically help you. So I went through your thinking for a change. I went through your responsible adult culture. I went through anger management courses, cage of rage. I went through uh, drug and alcohol courses. I went through family planning. And I just went through all of those social service classes, went to cognitive behavioral, uh, CBT, uh, and went through a bunch of stuff with trauma. And so for like my first 18 months in prison, and I was in a closed security facility, so I was basically locked down for about 20 hours of the day. So I would go in the morning from like eight to maybe two to class, and then I would come back to uh, the housing unit, 
and I would exercise and then I would basically start to uh, just read a bunch, right? So they had these little small things in prison. That's the only thing that really changed my life was reading, to be honest with you. All this other stuff was like an extension of it, but it was, um, it was actually, um, um, excuse me, a catalog called Bargain Books. And Bargain Books uh, was a catalog where you could order books about a third of the price. And basically people would send me 20 bucks here, 30 bucks here. My mother would send me like 35 bucks every week. And uh, from there I had to start ordering books. And I started ordering uh, newspaper subscriptions. And basically that's what started helping me, right? And so I used to be able to read, but I couldn't comprehend real well. I could speak, but I couldn't just comprehend what I was reading or I couldn't see a picture in my mind based on stuff like that. So I sat down with a dictionary, sat down with um, a thesaurus and literally stuff I would read. I would just go back and forth and just basically teach myself inside the sale. And I would go get these legal pads uh, from commissary and I'd start writing down books or notes on whatever it was that I was reading. And so what I realized was that the same ambition that I had with football to want to be good, uh, that that was nothing but an energy that I can basically put anywhere. You know, just the will to want to do better. You know, I don't care if I wanted to get it to anything. If I wanted to be a lawyer, a doctor, if I wanted to be an architect, if I wanted to be a carpenter, uh, just the will to want to do better existed inside of me. And I, like, I kind of found that, you know, when I was in prison. And so I just kept on reading and just and I would dream about stuff that I wanted to do when I got out. And eventually, uh, after a period of time, I would basically start to host some of the classes that I went through. And then basically four years later, they ended up letting me out. And so, uh, or three and a half years, or it came like three years, 11 months after I got out of uh, CBCF. And so I went to the CBCF, um, went through that for about four and a half months. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, luckily after that, I got a call from Omaha, Nebraska. They had a team called the Omaha Nighthawks who were just forming for a, um, uh, what is it called, a, um, uh, a minor league football team. So I went out there for a couple of years and I had like some very cool experiences. I think it was like actually uh, a benefit that I actually went there because I was able to transition slow uh, where nobody knew me. It was like, you know, nothing but football and back home and I didn't have any pressure to be anything other than just a father to my child and, and basically just, just transition easy. And uh, I was out there for a couple of years and, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, met a whole bunch of cool people, uh, start getting into like personal training with people because I told myself I need to make some money. I played football for a couple of seasons, used to train, personal train off season and also run some uh, football camps. And so I ended up coming back here in uh, 2013. This was like October 2013. And then that's kind of like when my life started. You know, that's when I first time uh, that I realized like being a convicted felon was like a real thing. So I, like when I, went, when I went out to Omaha, Nebraska, the team had arranged my housing arrangements, right? So I didn't have to say, hey, I'm a, I'm a felon, right? So when I came back to Ohio, I remember I probably went to like probably 15 places. You know, I would go to places and fill out an application for a house. I'm like, okay, I want to go live in Dublin. They're like, nah, 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 Jack. You know what I'm saying? You're a felon. You know what I'm saying? But, yo, can I get a picture with you? I used to be like, yo. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was, it was, it was like, this is serious. You know, this is like dead serious. And I was like, okay, this is weird. You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, it's, uh, and there's so my family. So this is what actually happened. I just gave you the story. Um, when we were done playing football and the football league got shut down, uh, Omaha had mandated I got 30 days to get out of the state, or Nebraska had mandated to get out of the state. And so I had 30 days to move back to Ohio and I'm bouncing back and forth trying to do this, you know what I'm saying? And then I don't have a whole lot of money, so I'm driving 12 hours to get here, or 12, 13, whatever it was to get here uh, to Ohio. I'm driving all around to Columbus you know, said trying to figure out, you know, where I can live. And so I was going through that. And so at this time, uh, I ended up meeting a random lady uh, who, I, who, I, who she seen me at her church one day. And so I called her, I was like, yo, you know, uh, I was like, let me just get to the point. I was like, this is my name, I'm a convicted felon, do you rent to him? And at this point, I never even seen a place. And so she was like, it's in Canal Winchester. I was like, I don't even know where Canal Winchester is at, right? And she said, it's close to Columbus. And I was like, all right, cool, I'll take it, you know what I'm saying? And so I ended up basically moving to Canal Winchester in 2013. And ironically, uh, ESPN had contacted me and they said, you know, uh, we would like to do a story in your life uh, about, you know, what took place at Ohio State and your relationship with Jim Trussell. So for that whole period of time, I came back and I was doing different appearances and speaking and all type of just random stuff to uh, just take care of myself, like just living month to month, check to check. And uh, I ended up basically uh, doing a, an event with um, ESP and a 30 for 30 came out and then from there, like, you know, I just got a bunch of uh, random speaking engagements to go to around the country. So I started to go speak everywhere. And uh, that was crazy in itself. I think people, they think that they want to speak everywhere and be on stages. Uh, but I tell you like that, it actually felt like prison more than you know, you know what I mean? And I'll say it like this, you know, when you're on a plane by yourself, you're in a hotel by yourself, you're on stage by yourself, you're on the road by yourself, like you do that, you know, but just think like this, right? And, and I, I spoke 330 times, right? Over like two and a half, three years. You feel where I'm coming from? So every other day you just speak and you turn into a robot after a while, you know what I'm saying? And uh, like you, you just like going from place to place, it just like became like real redundant and mundane and just like totally unhealthy for my life. 
And so I never seen my family the same way I never seen them when I was in prison. So it was like crazy for me, right? So I ended up basically saving myself some money. And in that process, uh, I ended up basically going to uh, start a trucking company. So I always wanted to be an entrepreneur of some sorts. And I had a goal of where I wanted to get to, but I also had to basically start somewhere to build up some money to get to there, right? So I ended up basically starting a trucking company and, you know, I ended up basically building that out, building that out to uh, about you know, 12 trucks and eventually transitioned into what I'm into now. Uh, and what happened was, um, this was what, 2015? Uh, basically, I went to a student athlete symposium and when I went to the symposium, um, uh, I found out that a gentleman was actually basically, I didn't know what behavioral health was prior to this. So I went to the symposium, the guy was basically teaching uh, student athletes cognitive behavioral therapy, activating the event, the mind activity, the body reaction, the consequences, how you process thought and become or end up to a desired result to keep yourself out of trouble. And what eventually happened was, I was like, you know, man, what are you doing? Like, how did you get that stuff? That's like stuff that I learned in prison, but it also had like impacted my life. And he was like, man, I run a behavior health agency. And I was like, I don't even know what that is. And he was like, we deal with mental health and uh, drug and alcohol. And I was like, really, that's like a real thing in society. He was like, yeah. And so uh, what happened from there uh, was that he uh, connected me with a, um, what is it called? A, um, a, a, um, a consulting company. And basically for like eight months, I was meeting with these people on a monthly basis, going over policies and procedures and just understanding what behavioral health was and all of the things that I had rejected. You know, I understood how it fit in my life. Uh, but I remember going through prison. I said, man, if, uh, if younger people understood how to think, or understood how to deal with their traumas early on, and uh, they can kind of be soft on people. Like, you know, I, I rejected a lady because of race. That was it, you know what I'm saying, when I was a young kid. But as I got older, I was like, man, she's just trying to do nothing but exchange information with me. And I didn't get there, but I thought that my role in this position could be me being a person to say, hey, you know, to young kids who may be like uncomfortable dealing with white people, suburban people, older people, you know what I'm saying? That makes sense. I just thought like that was my role inside of what we were doing because I thought it can connect more kids initially. And so basically that's what I started to do. And I opened up a, um, a, a, a facility called the Red Zone. And the Red Zone obviously being like a play on words with football and football when you're in the Red Zone, something's important. Either somebody's about to score or you got to stop them from scoring. But most people who have drug and alcohol and mental health issues is basically something serious when you get to the point of dealing with the law or you're dealing with you know just life in general. And so we started uh, in Youngstown originally uh, so I was driving back and forth between Columbus and uh, Youngstown and um, in the process of just building a, building a company. You know, so you start with three people, four people, five people. And eventually uh, what happened was the uh, school system that came to me and they said, since you're back in the area, uh, we would like for you to connect with the community. Jim Trussell was obviously up there. And he said, can you kind of connect with the school system and incorporate what you're doing inside the school system? And he was like, you know, if you don't change how these kids educate themselves, like nothing's going to happen. So I eventually went from there, uh, grew our team of people during that time. Uh, also, in, in that period of time, like, you know, I ended up basically messing up myself. So I had been out of trouble for like probably, what, 10 years at that point, 10, 11 years. And in the process of that, I caught another DUI, driving up 71. Uh, and at that point, I had basically been done with drinking and drugging for probably 10 years. But in the process of that, I was saying to myself, like, okay, I'm off probation. I don't have nothing to do. I've not dealt with this before. I'm cool. Sitting down, watching a football game. I go up. We, um, we're watching this Pittsburgh Steelers and the Kansas City Chiefs. And after I get done with the game, I say, hey, you know, I got to meet in Youngstown the next day. Let me go ahead and get on the road and drive up the street. And so I end up basically catching the DUI, trying to build a company to basically stop this stuff. And so it was like kind of crazy in my own life. And uh, one thing I found out that just um, at some point, some stuff has to stop in your life. You know what I'm saying? And like, you know, God removed it for a reason. And it was a reason I was moving forward. And then when I included it, basically I started getting back in trouble or I was in trouble. So basically just asked myself, you know, when have I ever in my life, my personal life, just gave myself everything I had and I uh, literally got myself back on track. But to get back into uh, get back into the story, I ended up basically uh, building a company. You know, we were uh, basically from seven to 10 to 12 to 15. And, uh, and we just start growing our footprint across uh, the community from basically being visible, talking about mental health and drugs and alcohol, uh, stuff that basically I had basically uh, had been through. And we had grew our, our school system to we like, I think we probably were servicing about 600 kids right now uh, from ages five to about uh, 13, 14. Uh, that, that's the majority of the kids. And then basically we started with um, the adults with our ALD program. And so we had started from an outpatient standpoint at first and then eventually grew to a housing system. So uh, we house, you know, families, we have men, men women, uh, and all different peoples in recovery from some point or another. 
and uh, we hire people trans. I mean, we, we not hire. We house people transitioning from uh, prisons, and we'll soon soon do like a, a community transition program with one of the uh, uh, the adult programs that we mess with. And so from there, I always live. Uh, well, I moved from Canal Winchester to Westerville, and uh, basically we started a program here. We've uh, we're off of Parsons right now, but we're looking for a larger space because we don't have any room where we're at. Uh, but basically started the same thing down here, started an adolescent program, uh, connected with the schools the same way in Youngstown. Uh, but property is a lot more expensive here, so it's a, it's a little bit tougher to expand as fast as we did up in Youngstown. Um, and from there, uh, just, just, just just ask you to just kind of what we've been doing. You know, I've had challenges with, um, you know, when you, when you first hire companies or when you first hire people, that's what I found out. When you first, um, excuse me, when you first, you know, you first get in the business and you are uh, and, and people give you a shot. You don't get the most talented people. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you get kind of like the people who just like love you or want to try something new or like they're not stable at another job. Like the best people are probably working somewhere else. <laughs> you know where I'm coming from? And uh, so you had to go through that. And then, you know, I had to go through um, I was trying to do something serious and people just not taking me serious as if like I was serious. You know what I'm saying? Like they look at you like, hey, I'm just working for Maurice. Like, nah, it's like a real thing. You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, this ain't the hangout. You know what I'm saying? Ain't the barbecue. And, uh, and so like, you know, you have to do that. Uh, I had to be tough on some friends. I fired like best friends. You know what I'm saying? You ever did that before? Like I fire, y'all don't mind, right? So, you know, you have to talk about like, you know, just and a lot of stuff got back down to um, just stuff I've learned through business, but also team, you know? establishing expectations, establish, you know, um, uh, establish structure, establish hierarchy, you know, so make sure you either, you actually, uh, even through HR, make sure you're, you're, you're wording your job description right and you're getting the right people in the door uh, for the right reasons, you know, so, uh, dealing with, you know, clients who repeatedly uh, just do knucklehead stuff and then have to re remind myself and the staff, like, y'all work for somebody who was like a repeated knucklehead. I feel where I'm coming from. And so being a little bit more empathetic and, and like how you deal with people, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, having, having to constantly explain that, you know, having to uh, run a business and, and make sure, you know, so we don't get huge grants from any, we don't get any grants actually. So, you know, actually running a business and, and being viable, it's 130 people on staff between both places. And when you're housing people and when, you, uh, and when, you, when you're housing people, you have that set of needs when you're uh, doing direct service, when you're working inside of courts and, and making sure the reporting is right, you're doing drug tests with people and making sure the corrective discipline is in place, all that stuff. Um, you know, all this stuff is serious, you know what I mean? But it's, uh, it, it, like, I, and the reason I say, I say that and stand here, you know, I was a guy who came from the knucklehead in the system, you know what I'm saying? And I just didn't see, like, even, even what I'm doing now, I still just don't see a ceiling to what I'm doing. I'm still just, like, constantly developing myself, you know, constantly working on myself and then trying to implement uh, things that I've done in my life to fix, you know, people who are, are uh, coming through the system to our staff and, and so on and so forth. So that's sort of like my, uh, my, my spiel, I guess, I don't know if anybody have any questions or not, but I told you. What's your greatest regret? My greatest regret? Um, I don't know. Um, I don't have any, I guess, you know. I, I was saying this, like, and I, and I don't know, I think I dealt with that in prison. I don't think that, um, I probably just, I'll tell you why I say it. Like, you know, when I, like, so whenever I was doing the choices I made, you know, whether I was having fun in nightclubs or whether I was, you know, BSing through, school or committing crimes it wasn't like i didn't know what i was doing you know what i'm saying i just didn't think that anything bad would come from it you know what i'm saying like i think that was the biggest thing so like i wasn't like oh, my regret that i did that because like i was having fun like you know like i don't want to say like you know i was partying i was having fun i was having fun doing all this stuff but i just didn't want to deal with the reality of growing up i think that's what most people don't want to do they don't want to grow up like because like when you when you have to grow up it's just like you have to like set a permanent standard for responsibility you know, people don't want, like, if y'all look at anybody who fails in life, it just come from basically not want to be responsible for yourself. You know, and then you just constantly go make excuses on why stuff isn't happening, but it's come down to, like, basic responsibility. So I don't, like, put like this, uh, uh, I, re I not regret, I'm, I'm, like, embarrassed sometimes that I've done some stuff, you know what I'm saying? I think I'm more embarrassed, so, like, so, so, so sometimes you see kids act crazy, you think that they was born like that, or, like, they come from that stock. Like, my mother has nothing to do with none of this stuff. You know, so my mother raised me right. I was just like stone cold fool. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, I'm more embarrassed of like I remember like so. I remember, remember uh, Carol Looper. She was a reporter here years ago. So Carol Looper, like I was in I was in on the third floor and she was um, interviewing my mother outside the courthouse. And my mom's crying. I was like, Yo, that's my mother. I did that. You feel where I'm coming from? And so like knowing that I was like the engineer from making my mother feel that way. Like I wasn't raised that way. Like I wasn't like I was raised in the neighborhood, but. It's a lot of people raised in the neighborhood, but raised right. 
You know, so I was raised right. I just did all the knucklehead stuff to try to like act like macho. You know what I'm saying? But I'm like, if you see, I joke. You know, I'm not like no tough guy. You know what I'm saying? Thank you for being here to speak with us today. Um, I come from a big football town. I'm sure you've heard of it, Canton, Ohio. Okay. And um, everything is about football there. Um, I was wondering your thoughts on the CTE brain disease. Um, if you think any of your emotional issues, your depression, anything like that had anything to do with the physical aspect of football or if you think that is a the cte brain disease is a real issue oh i, I would say it's, i think is not think i know it's real because you've seen uh the science behind it but i don't think it has anything to do with me um i, I just you know my, my like i don't know my like i wasn't like uh i wasn't operating up under like a, like a damaged brain you know so i was operating up under i thought i was a gangster that was it you know what i'm saying i really believe in my mind because that's what you know, like even when they come, when kids come to you all, adults come to you all, whoever come to you all, the environment that they go in calls for that. You know where I'm coming from? And so the environment I grew up in was calling for that. And, and like, that's a hard thing. Like y'all trying to unravel that. You know, so people trying to unravel that whole persona that you put on in the neighborhood to become whoever you are. And so that was, that was more of my function. And then I just didn't know how to transition from that, but I, I didn't have like a damaged brain and you know, I was going out here doing crazy stuff, you know, but like, you know, even when you do crazy stuff, you're just like expressing like emotions inside of you, you know, so like you feel away. So you may do something that may be out of character, you know what I'm saying? But you, but you just, just not knowing how to deal with emotions. Like I, I tell you like this, right? One of the best things that happened to me was uh, I used to do this thing in therapy called like we do with the emotional wheel, you know, so just learn how to put a word on an emotion. And then you say, okay, if you feel in a certain way, you can like diagnose how you feel and then you can treat what you have going on. So like, I think like when you talk about what people should do, I think like just being more um, aggressive with adolescent mental health. I think so. I think that that's a big thing because then like y'all getting the effects of it. I don't know who deals in the adult system, but the adult system ain't doing it, but inheriting everything that got that wasn't addressed in childhood. You know what I'm saying? And then once I got my emotions better, I was like, okay, I want to educate myself because I feel like control. And then when I educated myself, I was like, oh, I like to learn. I didn't like what they was teaching in school, you know what I'm saying? Like, I like to read books, you know, I'm reading a couple books now, but just, I like, I like how it make me feel, you know, I like how it make just the wellness of me, but so, I don't think it was ever that, you know, I just think it was just like bad choices from, like, I think how we identify ourselves, you know, everybody in here, you know what I'm saying? Like, how, how, you could take this thing, you take everybody's jobs off of them here, everybody uniforms, and the core of everything is how do you identify yourself? You know, so do you identify work for the county? Nah, that's what you do, who are you, you know what I'm saying? And I think like find it like you have to. I think everybody have to find themselves. You know what I mean? I think like that. That's what prison did for me. I found it like in an unconventional way. But you know, until you can move forward, like you got to find yourself aside from you know being Maurice Claret. Like the, the red zone is something I do. You know that ain't who I am. I told you, I'm the dude that like to swing the golf club at Top Golf. That's it. You know what I'm saying? I like to work out and exercise and joke with people, laugh with people. You know, make people happy, smile. But you know, I, but it, but it took me a while for me to get there. You know, but like, don't let, I mean, some people may have like damaged brains, but like, don't be a fool. Like everybody brain ain't damaged. You're like, oh, hey, come on, man. <laughs> They've been playing, like, so think about that. They've been playing football all this time and then all of a sudden, yeah. oh, y'all got CTE issue. Like, oh, because Will Smith made a movie, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> nah, Jack, I don't know. Because you work in this field of mental health, um, what have you dealt with? Did you struggle with focusing a lot? Because we have a lot of the juveniles that come through, and a lot of them, some of their issues, and talking to them, they struggle with focusing. Could you speak to that, or are there techniques that you learn on how to focus? With um, well, I, I didn't have trouble focusing, uh, and I don't think these kids have. Um, it, it comes down to what are you trying to focus on? You know, we, we like they they give energy to the foolishness. You know what I'm saying? So I think, I think finding something that you are interested in, you know what I'm saying? I, I, don't, I don't think like, you know, when you're talking about focusing, you know, a lot of them, um, I don't know, maybe have not been, been introduced through something academia. Uh, maybe like, you know, if you, if you gave a basketball to these kids or football to these kids, these kids would be dedicated for the whole day. You know, but, but, but discovering that there's more out there that you could be successful at, you know, then it puts a focus on. I think it's the same thing everybody here. Like, why, does there, why did everybody end up here? You, you seen something you like, you can aspire to be it. You know, you understood, okay, I got a personality that can fit on that platform. And then from there, I can go succeed. And then from there, once you're inside the institution, how do you climb it? You know what I'm saying? But you gotta get these kids exposed 
And like, that's all it was for me, just, and, and books exposed me. You know what I'm saying? Like, if, if we can do anything, like if we could do anything in the country for the state, it's, it's the adolescent literacy. I promise you, it's adolescent literacy, it's adolescent mental health and behavioral stuff. And I, I promise you, like, so we, we, like, so we offer Parsons and we get to these people and we start talking to these adults, man, all these people talk about stuff that happened in childhood. That's it, like, why are you smoking meth? Or why are you smoking, or why are you shooting up heroin? Why are you doing crack? Why are you doing this? It's all stuff, and so you're trying to, you know, you're not trying to take somebody from here and, and make them the president. You're just trying to make them into a, a more productive human being than where they're currently at. And so I say that even in social service, like I know everybody be like, yo, I'm gonna get into social service or I'm gonna work in government and I'm gonna change the world. No, you're not, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No, you're not. You gotta be happy that I'm gonna just take this person an inch further, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it may take a long time for me just to take them a couple inches further, but you set yourself up for failure thinking that you're about to be the wizard wonder worker, you know what I'm saying? And you gotta be like, and, and, and having like, that's a goal. Like, I'm gonna just take you a little bit further than where you were. I'm gonna get you from repeating these courts. You know, I'm gonna get you working a little bit longer. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna increase uh, levels of sobriety longer for you. You know, so I don't know if I'm just rambling or whatever, but that makes sense. You know what I'm saying? But like, you know, cause like you can get discouraged sometimes. You be thinking like, man, I'm talking to you, do you get it? You know what I'm saying? That's how I be at these people. So it's like, man, you get it? Be like, you know, these people have kids, everything, and so much opportunity, but then I'd be like, it's the same thing I did, kind of like squandered it away. But, you know, you're just trying to help people. And then, you know, those small victories, that's what this stuff is about. You know what I mean? Everybody want to be like, oh, I'm the person who saved everybody. It's not going to happen. You know what I mean? You're fighting drugs, you're fighting environment, you're fighting home, you're fighting all this stuff, but you may be like the only source. Like, I tell you, like this, I had a probation, I'll tell you, I had a probation officer. I think, man, this dude loved me. You know what I'm saying? He really wanted to see me do well. And you know, just like, I mean, this dude, he, he was probably like my social worker. I called him up like, man, I'm going through this, I'm going through that. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't do nothing with probation. You know, so I don't know who's who in here, but it wouldn't do nothing with, it wouldn't have nothing to do with probation, but it's somebody like you could just talk to. Or even now, even after I'm done, like I see him out and about, and I just like, man, thanks for uh, like not being like a butthole. You know what I'm saying? Or just thanks for being considerate when I was wanting to travel or, you know, whatever it was, or just somebody being encouraging to you. You know, I, I just think like, I don't know, that's, that's Maurice Claret's role in life. You know, I'm, I'm like, no offense, I ain't really like no leader. I'm just like somebody who got it right after messing up for so long. Uh, Cause I don't want to like, I don't even want that handle on me. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I'm cool. I'm just like a dude who easy going. Uh, I mind my business, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I, I, I don't do nothing foolish. You know, I'm real stern and firm with the people in our office. You know, um, I'm motivated. I'm, I'm like a highly motivated person. Um, you know, that's it. You know, but but I'm like, you know, I don't know. I just want to be. I want to. I just want to live and continue to be a positive example. I don't want to be a leader with all these expectations. And then I think like I'm important. <laughs> that ain't me. <laughs> well, how has the um, impact of the birth of your daughter? We was talking about that briefly, but how did that um, change your life? Yeah, it's, it's so good question. And I got. A, a, another announcement. So I got another, I got a boy coming in December. Oh, right? Congratulations. Right. Congratulations. Hey, right. Hey, look, look, right. So we was in the, uh, what they call the sonogram room. That's right. Ultrasound, whatever it's called. Oh, yeah. So I was sitting there and it was going and it was going. I was like, okay, I see that leg and I see the other leg and I don't, I, okay, there we go. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> and so I love my daughter, right? <laughs> And so I said, I feel guilty for getting this excited about a boy, right? <laughs> yes. And so I got excited. I was like, man, I didn't feel this way about my daughter. But I said, this feels weird, but I love her, right? <laughs> Anybody got any sons that know what I'm talking about? Yeah. That, that can save me, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It felt like, yeah, okay, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so now, nah, I mean, you know, I understand responsibility now, you know? Um, you know, it just, you know, you know, we, uh, me and my lady been together 14 years and you got people who depend on you, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, that's a, you know, it's a lot, you know, then you got another one coming into this world and so you gotta make sure you do right. You can't even have like small uh, incidents. You just gotta keep on doing the right thing. And so, um, you know, I, I don't know, I'm proud. I'm, I'm proud that she knows her father aside from football. She knows me as like, you know, person who was inside of an institution who play football at some point, cause she like see people coming up and talking. She'd be like, I don't really know my dad like that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know that, like y'all talk about that, but like, I, I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy that, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm happy that I just, I get it. You know, if that makes any sense. I'm happy I, I'm happy I get it. I'm, I'm happy that she inspires me to want to do better. 
I'm happy I got another child coming into this world, you know, hopefully healthy and, 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 and all that stuff. And I'm just, I don't know, I'm happy. I'm happy that I can just be responsible to all. Okay, that's good. Another question over here before. Go ahead. Thousands were crazy. I was, I grew up during that time too. I was in school, <laughs> so I, I get it. Um, you mentioned that you had to let go, you know, a couple of your friends when you first started off the red zone. Um, <clears throat> what are some of the qualities, uh, like some of the people that work, you know, that work for the red zone that you look for um, when when hiring, you know, uh, oh, your employees? Yeah. Um, what are the qualities? I think the, I think the biggest one just to have have energy. Like you know, when you first meet somebody, they just like low energy. I will never hire them. That might be just a discriminatory thing, but people who just like kind of like ah, uh, you know, social service. You got to be like, you know, what I'm saying you got to have energy for this stuff. You know, says so go beat you up. Um, um, look for some level of stability in their past life. You know, said so that they like was actually at places for a long time. Uh, that shows me that, you know, that they've been able to work through ups and downs at some point because I don't care where you go. You work for the county, the city, and you can go Washington, D.C., you're going to have problems anywhere you go, you know what I'm saying? But being able to say, hey, I was at a place for a period of time and that, you know, even what you were doing, that you were able to, like, get different skill sets in the process, you know what I'm saying? Um, and also, I just, I just like, when I describe the job, I, I like naming them, like, most – like uh, bad situations. I was gonna say the, uh, the S word, but you know what I'm saying, right? I, was, I named like the most worst situations and I just found out like they attracted to that. You know, so I just see how like, their face is when they like are, are when I was, so we got HR now, so they do it now, but they kind of like know what I expect. Um, and we talk about working long hours. We just named like a horrible job for the most part. And then we talk about the attractive stuff and we just say, see if you're interested. And so we know it's not gonna be that horrible, but if you don't mind, you know what I'm saying, coming into that space, um, we like to hire people, you know, like just like, you know, when you're interviewing somebody who's like self-sufficient, you know what I'm saying? Or, or they've uh, read the job description. They say, hey, man, these are my skill sets. This is what I can bring to the table, uh, you know, because you're a young company. And so with a young company, you're, you're growing and forming and shaping yourself. Like, I'm not Southeast, you know what I'm saying? So like when people walk into South, like, so I, I tell you this too, right? So when, when people go through school, they go get, be a, a social worker, counselor, whatever it is. When they train you, they train you to go into an environment that's like Southeast already. You feel where I'm coming from? And so when you come to a newer company, you know, you ain't coming into Southeast with a newer company, but you may have, we, we got more personality than Southeast. You know, we got more flexibility. Uh, we, we, we have, you know, it's still personal in the space that we work in. And so getting people to understand that you're building the environment, you know what I'm saying? Or if you go to a, like, so we went to a probation department in Youngstown, like when we hooked up with them, like we're, we're, we're able to accommodate you and whatever you're trying to get accomplished because we don't have like big infrastructure and, and understand that people can work within that. And, you know, I, I, these are people I don't like, man, we should do it like this over here. Like, all right, go back there then, you know what I'm saying? And so I don't like those people, those people bother me. <laughs> so um, I don't know, you know, and just people who like structure, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I believe in standing meetings, standing meetings like help you to produce like a great company. Um, you know, people who don't mind like, like just, I don't know, motivated people, high energy people, people who are, who, who, who on time, before time, like eight o'clock, I mean, 7.45 type people, you know, those people, you can win with those people. Um, you know, I, 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 for, for whatever reason, I like people who work out. You know, I think people who work out on a consistent basis are better people than who don't. No offense, you know, I just, I just really do, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I, I, I don't know if that sounded bad, but you know. Um, <laughs> I ask people what time, like, so I, I give, I give, like this. I want you to be as close to my life as possible, right? So I wake up every day consistently 4.45, right? I go downstairs in the basement every day, 5 o'clock, and I'm like a huge, like, vision board person. Like, I show you, like, I, I show, like, on Instagram or something, right? I got whiteboards all around my uh, basement. I, do, I still believe in meditation. I sit there, I meditate, I drink coffee, and I kind of, like, like, get my energy to a certain level. And then I go to a track. It's a little middle school track that I run on every morning. So I believe in exercise, you know, I believe in mind, body, spirit, you know, every day, you know, saying, or from doing calisthenics, working out. And then I believe in like, you know, so uh, for emails, it's a little small trick for y'all. If like you, you like a person who hate emails, like, so I get on the offense with people. So I always believe in like being like the offense. So I start pushing emails out to people, 
Oh, I know you. There you go. Oh, I didn't even see him walking here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. Oh, I didn't even see you walking here. This is a... Oh, yeah, this is a change in dynamic. Yeah. <laughs> it's too late now. It's too late. Hey. Okay. Yeah, right. Oh, I, I can stay longer. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> right. I, I guarantee he didn't probably see this years ago, right? So... <laughs> he told him, um, Prosecutor Ron O'Brien's up front. So yeah. Some of you didn't see him walking. Go ahead. But, I mean, well, at least you know what I'm doing now, right? So, uh, yeah, it's kind of cool. Like, this is like my, my favorite song, Elton John, A Circle of Life. Right? So, we go from, like, we've been around the mulberry bush, right? Yeah. So, no, nah, but that's it. You know, people who typically, like, are on that, you know, um, on that path. All this came off. Yeah. Let me get two more questions. And I have one up here, and then I'll take... Um, all right, so I got three. All right, so we got, we'll start here and then come to you and then um, come to Let me see, I think that's still good. I just want to say uh, we appreciate you being here. Your story is very inspirational. Um, when it comes to one of the things I, I think that you said that was very important was just uh, the transition, getting so many kids uh, to understand that transition and be prepared. Um, and, you know, it, it looks like you're trying to solve that from one aspect. What are some other uh, challenges that you think we should be addressing when it comes to uh, preparing more kids like yourself, um, kids from um, underrepresented uh, populations and um, things like that to becoming successful when it comes to college. Um, you know, what's what's your opinion there? It's all it's all education, bro. I tell you like that. I, from the bottom of my heart, I believe like the, the separation of people comes from just early child education, and a, a lot comes from how you identify. I guarantee you that. How, how the, the 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 problem for the country with people just how. how how do you see yourself? Go ask kids that. You know, kids come to sit down and try, how do you see yourself? If you see yourself as a gangster, you're gonna do everything like a gangster. I promise you, if you're talking about, like when you just say you take the man out of homes or mans are gone and you have broken families, like you're dealing with a bunch of kids who just are self-identifying, whatever makes sense within that neighborhood. That's the problem. You don't need to do all this other stuff or effects of it. The whole thing, like when I, when I go back to myself, I thought I was a gangster, right? I thought it was funny to go in the courtroom and oh, to hell with the prosecutor. This is stuff I thought. You feel where I'm coming from? Because in my mind, I'm a gangster. So these kids, you go up and down Livingston, you go out west, you go wherever. How are these kids identifying? That's the biggest thing. But a lot of that stuff is birthed from, and like, so now that I'm inside these schools, I can see how I start. So a kid comes to kindergarten, I'm prepared. So, so like this, I got a daughter who's 13, who's going to the ninth grade, right? So she'll graduate at 16, but she's accelerated her whole path due to her mother preparing her well early on, right? You need a, 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 a mission and a group of people attacking that before these kids get to kindergarten, first grade, right? So we, we deal with the behavior issues inside of schools. So what happens is she can't read, she can't behave. So what does she do? She starts to act crazy. So this, instead of like your face-to-face -face academic time, what is she doing? She inside with us working on behavioral issues. You feel where I'm coming from? And so she's inadvertently kind of getting tutored by us, but then kind of getting behavioral issues dealt with her. And then you'd be like, man, you know, it just happened because this kid's unprepared. And so you have a bunch of child learning centers, you know, saying, but if this stuff isn't focused on academically preparing these kids and setting that path like growing up, I'm telling you, that, that is it. There, it's nothing else. Like, why do dudes change inside of prison? They change because they start reading. So when these guys come out of prison, these guys be well read. You know, they debate all day, so they're a little bit sharper with making points. I mean, if y'all on probation, they probably debate y'all with every point, you know what I'm saying? And so dudes, you know, playing chess, conversing, reading books, and that's how guys get better. It's the only reason why I'm right here is just to, edu like, education separates people. It's, it's why housing markets are established. It's why schools are established. It's, 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 the, it's the greatest separator in, in figuring out who you are. I think those two. So I don't know how you get there, but I can tell you what I believe it is, you know. I don't know. Okay, right here. So I love the fact that you had stated that you were on medication, which in the black community, that's a lot of things you don't talk about, and that's one of the things. Do you utilize individual therapy as well, yeah, or so have you? So I go Wednesday, so my doctor actually left. He went to South Carolina, but I still go down to Ohio State. You know what I'm saying? So, but you like, so in order with, like, so, and, and it's just being frank with black people, we have to understand. Somebody has to take the step first and say, this, so like they think like a, a therapist is not going to solve your problems. They just help you to organize what's going on. You feel where I'm coming from? And then they just build a skill set to say, okay, let me build a skill so you work through the issues. And so the medication is, okay, 
just like you a diabetic and you take insulin, whether you take in whatever you take in, it kind of help to stabilize your blood or your blood sugar. It's the same thing. So when I explain it to them, they'd be like, oh, okay, that's what you're talking about. And do you have to talk like, so you have to talk about wellness, right? So I talk, I don't even say mental health. Mental health is like the buzz where I say mental wellness. And so I don't even think people know that it's a thing to be well. That's why I was talking to you about working out. I think that y'all should push exercise on these kids. Like as much as y'all do with, you know, being all the places you should do, I think you should push exercise. I think you should push recreational reading. And I think that you should push like just understanding what it is to be like well. You know what I'm saying? Like when you're stressed out, like, okay, I'm a well individual. I feel well. Like I do like scented oils in my house just so like aromatherapy, that stuff is real stuff. You feel what I'm coming from? And just understand how all those things play into your life of being well. I just told you about meditation. You know what I'm saying? Like how do you center yourself? How do you center your thoughts? And so, I don't know, if you, if you need somebody to talk, I definitely talk and, 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 and tell them the place and how it works. But it's, it's getting the information. Again, education, you know, you get the information and say, okay, this is how this works. But I, I go to Ohio State, you know, my, I got a new doctor on Wednesday, I don't know how he's gonna be. He could be sorry, right? <laughs> if he's something like, hey doc, you know. Right. All right, last question over here. Coming through the juvenile system and going through the adult system, is there one thing you can think of in the juvenile system that might have helped you change the way you were thinking before you became in, in the adult system? I, I don't know. I, through the juvenile system, I think the, oh, the great thing was um, Mr. Smith. I think if you had more Mr. Smiths, like even though I was going through community service, even though I was like meeting the requirements of the courts, I think like the... Um, the mentorship that he held with me, I think that that was like helpful, you know what I'm saying? But, I, but I'm pretty sure you, you would have to have a thousand people on staff to mentor kids. You know, that may be tough. And I don't know, I don't know, like, you know, uh, Governor DeWine just gave funding for initiatives like that. I don't know if you can put something together and, and allow that sort of relationship to happen with kids. Like, yeah, figure right, these kids is about the environments that they're in and just to have them be placed in a different environment. But I, I say one thing, y'all should probably, you should probably get Kella Conte in here. Mr. Conte, when I was in, in the prison system, he helped me. You know, he was the guy, like I said, he was, he was from South Africa. He said, you know, y'all throw people away in America. He said, I don't want that to happen to you while you're here. And he, he gave the platform um, to basically engage into social services. And so I say this all the time, like I was talking to uh, Gary Moore, and uh, I was saying to him, I said, you know, when they built prisons, they didn't build them and say, okay, here's the social service wing. You feel where I'm coming from? They just say, like, you know, we're going to develop social services within our institution. They said, okay, this is where we house them at. This is where they eat at. This is where they go to the barbershop at and so on and so forth. I really believe that if you, um, if you sort of, like, repurpose some space inside a prison, you know what I'm saying, because, like, you have, you have a ton of people, you know what I'm saying, who, like, I give you a prime example, right? So when it was time for me to sign up for these classes, he had signed me up and put me at the top of the list, but they'll come to the housing unit and they'll put the paper on the wall. And if you weren't there to sign your name, you won't get in. You know what I'm saying? But then you just have a concentration of people who just sit in the housing unit all day. Like, I don't think y'all really understand what prison is. Like, when y'all sentence people, you think, like, okay, they're going to go get rehabilitation, right? You're sitting people like this in a room and just say, okay, I'll see you back in four years. Like, this is what really happens. This isn't like a joke. This isn't like, uh, like nothing. This is like, hey, See you in four years. Like, this is like what really happens. And you sit here and you would think that even the correctional officer, you would like, you would like to think that the correctional officer should be a social worker instead of a correctional officer. And so you're dealing with a concentration of hate and you're dealing with a concentration of a bunch of people who don't have anything to do just sitting inside of a housing unit. You know, for most, of, most of these people ain't here for murder or for life. Most of these people are going to come back to society. You know what I'm saying? And so when you think about it, man, you should probably have conversations like, okay, what are, the, what are we doing with these guys inside the housing units? Because on some level, they coming back to y'all, you know, they're gonna be on uh, institutional control or, or community control in some capacity, you know what I'm saying? So the conversation be like, okay, if, like you, you think with all these resources, with all the stuff that y'all do, right? Y'all spend all this money for institutions. You can't get a social worker in the block. You know, you can't get a counselor in the block. You can't get some sort of therapeutic services in the block. You can't get some, like, when they, they do it in our field, peer-to-peer -peer support. You can certify peer-to-peer -peer support guys inside the institution and make that part of their recovery plan. You know, because you have enough guys inside the institution who have respect for one another where they'll basically talk to guys in small groups. I don't know. I, I have different ideas, but to, to sit people inside of a facility for years on end and think that they're about to transition very well and be like, okay, we'll give you a couple resources once you get out. Nah, that's not gonna happen. You gotta like start earlier. You gotta engage earlier, and then the, you know, the, the people who are on probation should be supporting the 
the post-release plan, you know, so I don't know, but. No, those are great, um, great thoughts there. All right, so I know some of you are past your lunchtime, and if your bosses are here, then you have an excuse. But, but if you don't, uh, use Maurice's name, and it'll be okay. Um, so I just wanted to say if that, that you guys have anything to say. I don't want to disrespect you to, do you have anything you want to say to, to Maurice at all? I would just say that I was a skeptic that first when the lawyer first contacted me when he was in prison and said that he had turned around uh, and he wrote a book that uh, his lawyer sent to me and uh, he had some blog posts and things of that nature. And uh, I uh, told his lawyer that it looked to me from afar that he had uh, truly rehabilitated himself, unlike many people we see that we send to prison, and that we were willing to give him a chance by agreeing to judicial release after three and a half, maybe three and a half years. And uh, that's a decision uh, that every day when we see the kind of things he's doing, we can say to ourselves, we made uh, a difference and we did a good thing. And, and as I read about uh, him, other than that one little mistake that you mentioned, uh, uh, I'm uh, uh, very happy to see that he is doing well for his family. And uh, as a recognizable person, I think that he's a great spokesman for someone who's committed to turning themselves around. And I commend him and compliment him. And uh, I just left court and uh, I uh, uh, walked in, uh, in there. I didn't want to stick my uh, head in the door, so I just snuck in and sat down here next to Judge Sadler. And, uh, and so I would just uh, will, will compliment you for getting him here to speak to this group. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I was excited. Obviously, I didn't have enough time to talk with him um, prior, but we'll try to see if he can come back again. He had so much of his story that he didn't tell us. I know some of you want to know more about football, but we didn't actually talk about football. We didn't really get too much into that. So um, can you help me thank him? So.